Thank you. Um, thanks to, uh, to Megan uh, for that introduction and for uh, the invitation to be here um, and also for the invitation to be here to the Science Institute, to Anissa, um, to James, uh, to David, um, uh, as, uh, as well as to uh, Christy Kiefer for helping to arrange travel. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge before we start that we're meeting on the historical and contemporary lands of native peoples, um, including uh, the Tulalip, Snohomish, Squamish, Snoqualmie, Muckleshoot, uh, and Duwamish nations. Uh, and uh, I have kind of a bunch of text in these slides, um, so if you would like to read the text at your leisure in the future, rather than scrawling it down, um, this talk um, will remain available um, to download. Um, the slides will. Uh, who here is a data scientist of some sort? <laughs> I'm so, okay, uh, hands hands up. Data scientists. Okay, we've got like some data scientists of some sort. Who here is a historian? Okay, we've got a number of historians, great. Um, who is a, an STS scholar of some description? Okay, STS -E audience, great. Um, is anybody a chemist? Okay, some, some people with some, some backgrounds in chemistry. Um, the chemistry won't be, it'll be like intermediate level chemistry. <laughs> uh, my talk today and my work in general um, engages uh, the intersection of um, these two questions of great interest for STS scholars, as well as scholars across a bunch of disciplines in the present day, um, being digital, um, the topic of a 1995 book, Nicholas Negroponte, published by MIT Press, um, and being material, uh, the topic of a book just published um, out of MIT that in certain respects is a response to um, the, uh, the shift maybe um, or change in understandings of the um, independence of or maybe relationship between the digital world and the material world. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways to ask questions, um, including the kinds of historical questions that I'm interested in about the relationship between being digital and being material. Uh, some of you probably know the work of Nathan Ensminger at Indiana University on the environmental history of computing. Um, so what are the material impacts of digital stuff? Uh, but the dimension of this question I'm interested in is um, how digital information systems and data structures, especially, um, enact, that is, attuned to, interact with, or shape, as Anne-Marie Mall puts it, uh, material chemical substances um, in identifying, representing, and classifying them, um, and especially in bureaucratic contexts in which information systems f that enact chemical substances in certain ways are reused uh, for a broader variety of purposes. Uh, so this is really a question about the being of being digital and the being of being material. What kinds of beings um, are brought into existence um, through the interactions between the digital and the material, a question of ontology. Uh, take, for example, uh, the current applications of machine learning and big data um, to drug design. Uh, methods have been developed using virtual libraries of billions upon billions of chemical compounds, billions of different molecular structures like these, um, and uh, methods for modeling the properties of these chemical substances, what might make them useful drugs, safe drugs, or less so, um, have developed to the point that, um, at least in the opinion of some people working in this field, uh, the bottleneck in our exploration of chemical space has become the material ability to dare to make compounds. It's a strong framing of the process of drug discovery in digital terms. The exploration of chemical space in virtual form is what's central here. We can also see this in efforts to grapple with the potential um, hazards of the material world um, to human and environmental health. Uh, very similar sorts of techniques in many cases often picked up from drug, um, drug discovery uh, methods have been developed to try to model the toxicity of chemical substances, 
along all of these various different sorts of dimensions. Again, generating a 3D map of chemical space. Uh, a specific example of how a lot of these methods work um, is provided by uh, quantitative structure activity relationship analysis. And we can talk about the history of this particular set of methods if you'd like. But um, in this method, and in most of the kinds of modeling methods in the fields of drug discovery and toxicity assessment, uh, what happens is that there's a structural formula, a representation of a chemical substance, this familiar form of doodles of hexagons and CLs and Os representing the in connections between atoms that constitutes one nanoscale unit of a certain chemical substance. Uh, this molecular structure gets analyzed in certain ways, um, calculating certain parameters that are supposed to help you um, represent or understand some property of the substance correlated with its efficacy as a drug or its toxicity. Uh, and then those parameters get fed into a formula developed through analysis of a certain family of chemicals or, and a certain endpoint, a certain potentially toxic effect. Uh, a little bit of reference data, actually measured data, is uh, fed in, um, and then uh, the output is the predicted biological effects of some chemical substance that has not been empirically studied. This is modeled data predicting the potential toxicity um, or pharmacodynamics or some other biological property of the substance. Part of the process of designing these sorts of methods it's not just in the statistics of doing the correlations, analyzing the measured data, building the models, uh, but in the data structures that are used to represent this diagrammatic formula for a chemical substance in a machine interpretable way. Uh, lots of different ways of doing this. You can have one of these impossibly long and illegible chemical names. That's one way of representing this structural formula uh, in terms that are manageable otherwise, but that's not so useful for doing this kinds of calculations. You can have a database identifier that's just a unique identifier, has no information about the structure in it, so that's not useful for this. Um, you can use a expanded and explicit tabular format called a connection table. I'll talk about these a bit more in a moment. Um, that definitely contains the information necessary for doing this kind of processing, but um, in an expansive form that can involve more money, more time, more storage space, more processing power, isn't an economical way to do this modeling. And then there's sometimes other clever forms of representation, like this form of string known as the SMILES format, um, developed expressly to facilitate this kind of modeling work. So lots of different data structures for representing this molecular structure, this um, uh, set of atoms connected by a certain set of bonds. A couple observations make about this. First, this is an old, this way of thinking about how chemistry can be done virtually rather than materially in the laboratory has been around for a long time. Uh, philosophers and scientists were anticipating that science, chemistry would become a science of information since at least the late 60s. Uh, information resources were vital, um, as vital as the thermometer to doing chemistry since the early 20th century. Uh, and the exploration of chemical space was leading in a direction that some chemists termed uh, mechanical, scientifically uninteresting since the late 19th century. Second observation is that this way of representing chemical substances is old as well. Um, it's been around since about the 1860s, um, since before most of the what we now consider to be the foundations of how chemistry works. Electrons mediating relationships between atoms were, had even been conceived of. Um, and yet, uh, these molecular structures of the, are the foundation of this whole operation. Um, even when uh, we're working with properties that correspond to biological endpoints, acute toxicity, mutagenicity of DNA, carcinogenicity, and so forth. Um, those, uh, in most of the cases, the application of these tools, uh, this data is being modeled. It's being modeled based on uh, different ways of taking apart these very same structural formulas. 
this idea that a chemical substance is a structural formula representation is some machine readable or information management friendly representation of the identity of that substance uh, dates back to actually a partic particularly specific point in time, a big conference at 1892, which I'll speak about in a moment. Um, and I think of this as the molecular ideal. Um, it's not how chemists think about what chemicals are. Chemists know that chemicals behave in all sorts of different ways in different material media, in different environments. They can take on different three-dimensional shapes. Uh, sometimes a whole bunch of different chemicals behave in a similar way. Sometimes one chemical can take on different structures in different uh, situations. Uh, but um, it is a, nevertheless, a sort of default assumption of the appropriate level for identifying what counts as an individual chemical substance. Uh, it was developed as the basis of a print information infrastructure for chemistry, on top of which a digital information infrastructure for chemistry has been built, on top of which modes of governing chemicals from intellectual property to environmental toxicity have been constructed. Uh, and this is the subject of my book, uh, Compound Words, Chemists' Information and the Synthetic World, um, in which I trace this story up through the beginnings of the era of the use of digital electronic computers for doing this sort of thing in the mid-1960s. Uh, I'm going to uh, present little bits and pieces of a number of arguments I make in this area over the course of the talk today. Um, first, the molecular ideal originated as a way to organize printed chemical bibliographies in order to support R&D in the chemical industry. So this was for print and it was for information management. Um, it purposefully didn't address all sorts of stuff and all sorts of ways of thinking about stuff uh, that was important to chemists. So it wasn't supposed to address everything. Uh, it had historically grounded affinities with certain methods for uh, mechanical methods for information retrieval and processing. Um, and for all of these reasons, we see that um, an introduction of mechanical tools for information management, computers, uh, mechanical and electronic, uh, was originally applied to the problem of bibliography, generating databases that suggested that this limited molecular ideal was universal, um, which led to the development of computational methods, information infrastructures, and administrative procedures, laws, forms of governance, bureaucracies, uh, built on the foundation of that assumed universality of this molecular structure is defining what counted as a chemical. In my talk today and in my work more generally, um, I draw on work um, in both media philosophy and anthropology thinking about the relationship between the ideal or the digital or the virtual and the material um, in various different ways that don't necessarily reflect what these authors intended these ideas to uh, be for, but, but you know, nevertheless, these are ideas I think I find, I find very generative. Um, I'm gonna quote three of them. First from John Durham Peters' The Marvelous Clouds. Uh, Ontology, whatever else it is, is usually just forgotten infrastructure. Uh, from the feminist philosopher Elizabeth Gross's The Incorporeal, without ideality, without some kind of plan, map, model, ideal, direction, theme, materiality, stuff, could not materialize itself. So there's no such thing as raw materials, just like there's no such thing as raw data. Uh, and third, the simplification of ontology, the articulation of this really convenient stratum of all material substances that can be represented using the same kind of chemical structure, seems often to be associated with enormous complications of epistemology. In this case, really, really complicated efforts to model the toxicity of individual chemical substances in a world in which People, humans, non-humans, are constantly exposed to like all sorts of these things, right? Not just individual substances one at a time. Uh, over the next half hour, maybe 25 minutes, I'm gonna take you through a kind of sampler platter of my work uh, in this area, starting out with um, 
the argument of my book, Compound Words, moving on to a few comments about the connection between this chemical history um, and the history of a very different field of science, um, applied science, graph theory. I'll talk a little bit about um, the uh, applications in computational science fields within chemistry and without of some of these chemical data structures and methods, um, and then move on to some of my work on uh, how the application of chemical databases developed for these kind of internal chemical science and industry purposes in environmental governance has created some of the um, successes and also shortcomings of uh, environmental politics and environmental regulation in the present day. So compound words. So we're in the late 19th century. High-tech industry, synthetic organic chemistry, we're taking coal tar, this carcinogenic nasty sludge, we're making brilliant dyes like Diazo Brilliant Scarlet RON Extra, um, great exciting drugs like aspirin and heroin. These are both the work of the Bayer Corporation. Uh, and these are fields of industrial science that are built on the foundation of structural organic chemistry. Structural organic chemistry was and the answer to a major puzzle for chemists in the mid 19th century. And that is that sometimes chemical substances with the same composition, C3H8O, um, had different properties, propyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. This was a, a puzzle in the field of organic chemistry, the chemistry of carbon-based substances. Uh, because in inorganic chemistry, the chemistry of minerals and salts, Things with different compositions had or with the same composition had only one set of properties typically. Um, so this problem of isomerism, as they called it, was a kind of constitutive of the research enterprise of organic chemistry in the mid 19th century. Um, and one particularly fruitful way of grappling with this problem involved using diagrams, diagrams that came to be known as constitutional or structural formulas. Uh, that posited a kind of set of connections among individual atomic bits um, as a way of trying to make sense of some of these differences in properties among chemicals with the same, uh, same composition. This is from a 19, an 1858 article in Philosophical Magazine, a British publication. These structural formulas were not supposed to represent what chemists thought the material world was actually like at the nano level. Chemists were really insistent about this. These were just heuristic, useful representations of experimental regularities that allowed them to reason graphically about these regularities that manifested themselves in the laboratory. And so if you draw propyl alcohol this way, three C's in the OH there, versus isopropyl alcohol, three C's in the OH in the middle, um, you can explain the different patterns of reaction um, of these compounds, and maybe even start working your way towards trying to explain the differences in their properties. So this was exciting, led to an expansion of the enterprise of organic chemistry. Um, but there was a kind of a, a large space in chemistry between these very simple compounds, like propyl and isopropyl alcohol, and uh, substances that were kind of the brass ring for chemists who were wishing to try to um, make valuable natural substances synthetically, um, like the drug quinine um, or the dye indigo. And so chemists working their way, trying to bootstrap their way up from these simple substances to the more complex substances, uh, synthesized like lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of chemical substances um, that had not previously been found in nature. And since they were synthesized in the process of trying to reason their way forward structurally, thinking with constitutional formulas, often chemists would assign these new chemical substances names based on their interpretations of their molecular constitution or structure. Uh, however, frequently different chemists investigating the same compounds would do this in different ways. And so as chemists started collecting the uh, fruits of their work, all of their publications in bibliographic compilations, information resources, started to see an accumulation of names like chlorinitrobenzol and nitrochlorobenzol, 
and monochloronitrobenzol and mononitrochlorobenzol. Uh, four different names for the same compound, or maybe not the same compound, not entirely clear on four different pages, no cross-references. This was becoming a mess, um, and a mess that many chemists in this field felt was threatening the continued progress of their enterprise, an enterprise that, with all those dyes and drugs, was starting to become quite profitable. So a bunch of them got together, and in 1892 uh, met uh, for a big congress, the one and only time that very important chemists have gotten together to talk about chemical nomenclature and only chemical nomenclature. This was at 18, in 1892, um, and it was a chemical constitutional moment, um, which is a joke, but it's more than a joke uh, because the basis of uh, how the literature of chemistry, the bibliography of chemistry was going to be put in order was by means of finding a fixed, determinate way of translating these structural formulas into systematic names and back. Uh, the members of the Congress came up with this set of rules that constituted um, an algorithm, although they didn't refer to it as such, but that's what it was, uh, for uh, writing official names of compounds uh, that were faithful translations of the molecular constitution. We're supposed to represent the compound just as the structural formula does, which is to say that you could map back and forth between structural formula and chemical name. Uh, these were only supposed to apply to chemicals of a known constitution. You couldn't write one of these names for a chemical compound that hadn't had its molecular structure determined, or that couldn't have its molecular structure determined, um, like the mineral asbestos doesn't have a molecular structure in the same way. Uh, and these names, uh, as one of the pioneering chemists to first use these structural formulas pointed out, were therefore not necessarily names of substances so much as they were names of formulas. The name was the name of a formula, not the name of a substance. It was a representation of a representation, not directly tied to the material. Um, but that was OK, because the chemists knew what chemicals were. right? They weren't going to get confused. They weren't going to confuse a formula for a substance. Um, they just wanted to be able to more effectively use their, by this time, 5, 10, 20 volume encyclopedias giving data and bibliographic references for all the world's research on all the world's chemicals, at least within the domain of chemists working in this mode of molecular chemistry. So these names worked out more or less. Um, there were some hiccups, uh, but they were applied by uh, institutions, rapidly growing institutions, um, uh, that were engaged in this work of chemical bibliography indexing, compilation. Uh, one of the central such organizations was Chemical Abstracts, uh, a branch of the American Chemical Society based in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, associate editors at Chemical Abstracts in 1938 wrote about what the work of using this method of nomenclature, compiling these indexes, uh, involved. Uh, she said, we read aloud in pairs, one checking the cards and the other the galleys. This is for the production of a collective index at the end of a 10-year period. A few hours of choice bits like C20H25N3O, delta 2 pyrazoline 5, open parenthesis, 2 furyl, close parenthesis, 1 phenyl 3, open parenthesis, so on and so on, is enough to make us real. And there's some really interesting commentary on uh, index work as labor and the embodied experience and the kinds of um, psychological and, and physical traits necessary to succeed in this job, in this article. Uh, but this was, this was difficult work, um, and it was uh, expert work. You had to really understand how these names worked better than the chemists did in order to compile uh, these resources. For this reason, uh, as the cost and quantity of expert labor in this field of chemical compilation increased, uh, the purveyors of new machine methods of information management saw this as a lucrative field of application uh, for uh, things like punched cards and then later digital electronic computers. The biggest push at the moment in the view of this aspiring entrepreneur, Calvin Moore's 1947, uh, was not governments uh, or even large libraries, but the American Chemical Society. 
uh, yada, yada, yada. A lot of interesting stuff happens in the 1950s and 60s, which we can talk about. But um, by the early 1960s, chemical abstracts really solidifies its place as the major player in the global chemical information business through the development of a uh, computer database that is going to facilitate their compilation of their printed resources, but also serve as a clearinghouse for what counts as chemical identity for chemical substances for anybody who um, is, is looking for a sort of authoritative definition of what a chemical substance is and determining whether what they're working with is the same thing that they think it is. Uh, this involves uh, the mapping of structural formula into one of these connection tables, which then gets tied to a database identifier, a unique ad identifier called a registry number, which then is used as the connector. So you don't have to go back and your machine um, parse through the connection table every time to deal with the identity. So it's kind of like a molecular social security number if the connection table is a molecular fingerprint. So 1965, CAS registry, big computer system, authoritative definition of what chemicals are, um, the identity of individual chemical substances, um, organized around this idea of the molecular structure as the implicit but now kind of hidden, submerged site of what entitles a substance to be counted as a chemical. Chemists weren't the only people to get interested in these kinds of structural formulas. Uh, mathematicians got interested in them too. Uh, one of the mathematicians who was most excited about the possibilities of structural formulas was the uh, British, British American, he worked at Johns Hopkins, mathematician James Joseph Sylvester. Um, Sylvester read textbooks filled with structural formulas and, as he wrote, felt like Aladdin might have done in walking in the garden where every tree was laden with precious stones. The precious stones were these structural formulas, uh, which he referred to as chemical graphs. What was interesting to Sylvester was that chemists were using these visualizations of their objects of inquiry um, as heuristic representations of abstract relationships. They weren't to be construed as representations of geometric reality. They were just convenient objects for thinking with. Uh, Sylvester thought this was great because he could do his really hard form of algebra um, uh, called invariant algebra by representing certain algebraic forms in a similar way, take chemical graphs, generalize them as graphs. Um, and this was the first use of the term graph to refer to a mathematical object constituted of binary relationships between entities, so nodes and edges. The stuff that is the foundation of social network analysis, present day, and all sorts of other representations, um, such as, say, the insignia of the eScience Institute. You can see it up on the wall. <laughs> but, um, so there were a lot of dimensions of graph theory that came out of lots of other investigations, um, but the, the object of the graph came out of a mathematician's generalization of chemistry. Uh, and um, uh, that's important because, again, as I said, for chemists, these names, these structural formulas, names based on them, were not supposed to be representations of reality um, exactly, necessarily. They weren't independent from molecular reality, but they were convenient devices for pointing towards substances that could be subjected to further inquiry. Uh, for mathematicians, the graphs were the objects themselves that they could study, that they could analyze, that they could make the subject of a field uh, that came to be known as graph theory. Um, and mathematicians continued working on chemical uh, compounds and chemical questions in some pretty foundational work in the field of graph theory and combinatorics. But I want to move on from the mathematicians uh, back to chemistry for a moment. Uh, there were a number of applications of uh, mathematics involving graphs um, and involving various formal manipulations um, of uh, linguistic uh, data that um, drew on chemical names and chemical examples in this period. Early machine translation efforts were focused on chemistry. 
uh, both because chemical names had this well-structured property that made them seem like a good starting point for doing natural language processing, and because chemistry was important and you could get government funding to translate all the Russian chemistry in 1950. Uh, same thing is true of uh, some early expert systems, AI, that was oriented towards developing expert systems to uh, uh, use automated methods to test scientific frame and test scientific hypotheses in um, more general ways. Uh, but I'm going to talk about an effort that was squarely located within the field of chemistry. I'm going to play you quick little animation here. This is from 1973. The pictures that you see are being generated on a graphics display terminal by a digital computer, the program which is trying to apply to synthetic analysis. The version of Lhasa which will be seen here is the result of a long-term project which was begun in 1967 at the University. The goal of the project is to develop a tool for use by synthetic organic chemists, which to assist in the planning of organic syntheses. Lhasa accepts chemical information according to the standard Computer, we push go, and the computer starts working backwards, taking this complicated part. That's the idea. You can see molecular ideals starting to take hold in chemistry. Now we're not talking about these molecular structures representing substances that we've got in front of us. Um, or names as references in a bibliography, but as objects that are being manipulated and kind of understood as having their own kind of logic to them. Um, this is with the, of the chemist E.J. Corey at Harvard and a group of graduate students and postdocs in the 1960s and 70s developed through the 1990s. This program, LASA, Logic and Heuristics, Applied to Synthetic Analysis. Uh, it was developed in a modular fashion, graphical communication, perception of structural features, and so forth. These are all activities that the computer is doing with a human user mediating the transition from each stage to the, uh, to the next. Uh, and uh, it was an activity, the automation of these various different aspects of what it meant to plan an organic synthesis of a complicated molecule that as our narrator Jeff Howe, an early grad student on the project, pointed out, involved um, expressing explicitly and consistently chemical ideas, ideas about subunits of molecular structures and transformations in a forward direction and in a backward direction of synthetic substances, uh, more explicitly than chemists were accustomed to thinking about these processes. And we can talk about the development of data structures in order to enact this explicit representation and to serve as interfaces for transferring data back and forth between the different modules involved in this program. 
But the point I want to make is that uh, the chemists developing this program saw what they were doing um, and went to great pains at least to present what they were doing as chemistry rather than programming. Uh, this was uh, an effort to write out chemically meaningful flowcharts and translate them into a chemically meaningful high-level programming language um, that would result in um, an enterprise not less challenging and rewarding than the conception and execution at the wet lab bench of a synthesis of one of these molecules itself. So this process of making explicit the process, the ways of thinking about planning a synthesis for the purposes of automating it was seen as chemistry. And in fact, it was within chemistry and not within the realm of uh, the development of AI expert systems that this enterprise took hold. Uh, the LASA project kind of petered out, never really caught on as an aid for working chemists. But retrosynthetic analysis, the way of thinking about the process of planning the synthesis, became the taken for granted way that chemists now, um, since the 1990s certainly, um, have gone about learning and often practicing uh, the planning of organic syntheses. So this was uh, the development of a way of thinking in chemistry that came out of this automation project, out of thinking about uh, structural formulas, out of the molecular ideal. So stepping back to the 1960s, still in the US, a period where um, a lot of what seemed to many to be similar kinds of concerns about human health and environmental health started popping up. Um, concerns about things like uh, radioactive fallout from nuclear weapons testing, about pesticide use, about potentially harmful um, pharmaceuticals, about cigarette smoking. These are things that you wouldn't necessarily think all belong together um, in the same collection of concerns. Um, but for efficiency-minded uh, administrative reformers within the US government, and this is a pattern that was repeated across many different parts of the world um, in this period of the early Cold War, um, these were problems to be yoked together through coordinated information systems, computer-based information systems, ideally, if they could. And in this case, they could because it's all chemists or the um, policymakers thought about chemicals, right? If you want to deal with the hazards of uh, pollution in the natural environment, um, the thing to do is set up a big systems model and break it down to uh, particular substances interacting in the environment in some way relating to man getting disposed of. Um, if you could grab hold of individual molecular substances, substance by substance, you could control the hazards of human um, industrial activities to human and environmental health. The CAS registry number was uh, an ideal tool for this purpose because it allowed you to assemble a coordinated and complete computer-based file of toxicological information uh, that would constitute a total body of chemical and biological information, drawing together everything that was known about the biological effects of all of these individual chemical substances, whether they were uh, showing up in emissions from a petrochemicals factory or in cigarette smoke, correlate studies um, of substances in all these different contexts and spit out an answer about the hazards that might be associated with each of them. Um, in fact, the CAS registry number was actually funded. The CAS registry was funded by the US National Science Foundation expressly for this purpose. Uh, by the late 1970s, uh, the use of the CAS registry and specifically these registry numbers had caught on. It had become a universal identifier that, as, this, uh, as an NIH computing expert put it, um, should be what scientists think of um, as the uh, link between um, of uh, the thing linking um, all chemical information together as a body. The body of chemical information um, is held together by the universal identifier. So now we've got this new kind of concept of a body of chemical information being constituted by the links created by these identifiers. 
as one of the architects of the um, early implementation of the U.S. Toxic Substances Control Act, an environmental chemicals law passed in 1976, put it. Um, this also created trouble. The CAS means of identification led to all kinds of technical issues, nomenclature issues that took huge amounts of time and resources. Uh, messing around with these registry numbers and with chemical names uh, turned out to take all these resources and seem at least to uh, uh, this EPA official to have nothing to do with protecting health and safety um, it was just a bureaucratic exercise. Uh, so I think that one way of reading this quotation is understanding that the, the, what protecting health and safety meant in this period of the 1970s and early 80s was precisely a bureaucratic exercise. It was the bureaucratic management of information about chemical substances by means of CAS registry numbers, um, and ultimately uh, using a system built on the foundation of the assumption that these structural formulas represented material reality. Uh, that was what uh, the development of an infrastructure of law administration uh, came to be all about. Uh, this is what I think of as molecular bureaucracy. Uh, you can think about it if you're familiar with um, Michel Foucault's notion of governmentality, right? an ensemble of uh, institutions, um, practices that articulate a population so that it can be uh, measured and managed. Uh, molecular bureaucracy is kind of like the governmentality of the material world. It articulates a population of materials as chemical substances of given structures uh, that can uh, be managed accordingly. Uh, it doesn't always reflect what these materials are like. In fact, at least a sixth of the substances that are um, governed under the Toxic Substances Control Act cannot be represented as molecular structures, things like asbestos, again, really important substances um, for health. Um, but workarounds had to be developed, jerry-rigged approaches implemented in order to make those square pegs fit into these like, very, very well-established and entrenched round holes. Uh, molecular bureaucracy has had all sorts of um, very enabling effects for political claim making and for legal claim making about the hazards of chemical substances. Uh, the capacity to connect hazards associated with such different products and exposures as the manufacturing of Teflon pans and the uh, uh, use of firefighting foams on military bases. Um, uh, you know, the ability to use this material unities to connect very different kinds of activities and make broader health claims um, has been enabled by molecular bureaucracy. Uh, but in the same way, the pattern of what some public health scholars call toxic chemical whack-a-mole, um, in which lots of attention is focused on making a claim about a particular chemical substance only for some other substance that presents similar hazards to slip in in its place. Um, that has been enabled by this molecule by molecule approach to governing the material world as well. And importantly, um, to wrap up, uh, a way of thinking about both the hazards of the chemical dimensions of industrial modernity and ways of um, addressing and redressing those hazards um, focused on the enumeration of damage to bodies, to lands, has been not determined, but, but strongly enabled by molecular bureaucracy, by this molecule by molecule approach to thinking about the negative biological and environmental endpoints of individual materials. Um, this is not a system that has proven, at least so far, especially adaptive to or enabling of making uh, the kind of claims that the education scholar Eve Tuck refers to as desire-based. Uh, research agendas and political claims, claims that take the complexity um, and self-determination of individuals who might be subject to certain forms of uh, negative effects of um, uses and disposals and exposures to chemicals into account. Um, and the kinds of claims that ironically um, might enable people to think not just about what we do not want our chemicals to do, um, but ask the much more radical question of what do we really want 
the chemicals that we manufacture and use to do. What do we need out of them? What do we want out of them? How do we wish to be in relation to them? Um, those are the sorts of questions, I think, to wrap up, that might be opened up by thinking outside of the framework of this universal set of uh, objects articulated by molecular structures, uh, to think more historically about chemical substances as things with pasts and futures, which is uh, a mode of thinking about chemicals that chemists themselves, including one of the architects of this very field of structural organic chemistry, Charles Girard, argued for. Instead of hypothesizing about molecular structure, he wrote, I define substances by their, by their metamorphoses, that is, by their past and their future. So I can comment a little bit about how I think that might be done or is being done, uh, but I'll leave it at there for now. Thanks. I told you I had lots of text. <laughs> Happy to take any questions you have or go back and dig in in a little bit more detail to any of the moments in the talk. Yeah. I don't know that I've yeah. fully formulated my question yet, but um, I, so I love how you um, link the kind of ontologizing of what counts as a chemical to um, you know, the, the ways of categorizing and managing chemicals and the implications that has for um, regulating the chemical industry and its, its ramifications on human health. And I, I just am wondering if there's, uh, if you could say more um, thinking in a, in, in a similar vein about the um, LASA program and the, um, the establishment of, what, I forget what you call it, retro- Retrosynthetic analysis, yeah. Analysis um, as kind of the, the standard in uh, synthetic chemistry. What are the sort of um, ramifications or implications for epistemological traditions within chemistry? Like, what, what does that foreclose and enable in the same way that molecular bureaucracy forecloses and enables certain things on the regulatory side of things? Sure, that yeah, that. yeah, definitely. Um, so mm -hmm. one noteworthy feature of the development of retrosynthetic analysis was that this was a way of thinking about, um, so it was planning a synthesis in the 1950s and 1960s in synthetic organic chemistry, a synthesis of a complicated molecule was like the most fun and awesome thing you could do and creative thing you could do as a chemist. So this was very much, the development of this automation program was very much um, a controversial thing seen as somebody trying to kind of put computers where they don't belong. This is like, this is the fun part, this is the creative part, this is the place where in hu genius, kind of brilliant human intuition is contributing new ideas to the font of uh, the chemical sciences. Um, but it came out of a, a pedagogical context. Corey had to teach an intro course, of, like a bunch of grad students, how to think about synthetic planning. Um, and it was in the course of thinking about making this process more accessible uh, that uh, he started working out this method. So there's a kind of a, a disciplinary politics to it um, of as it's a kind of a democratizing move within the field of synthetic organic chemistry. So that's one answer. Uh, the other answer, and this is the one that probably most chemists in the present day would say, is that it uh, channels uh, the uh, field towards the development of these really complicated multi-step syntheses involving individual clever chemical transformations um, that tend um, often not to be particularly commercializable because there are like too many steps and you lose 1%, you know, or maybe 5 or 10% at each step and pretty soon your yield is low and there are too many steps, it's not economical to do it. Um, and uh, they tend to uh, not favor thinking about the kinds of factors that people in the field of green chemistry, say, in the present day would, um, would value most. What kinds of reagents are you using? What kinds of materials are getting generated um, in middle steps? Are they going to be hazardous if they get emitted, you know, if you're thinking in terms of something that will perhaps be scaled up. Um, and there are ways to introduce in some of the development of LASA and other similar synthesis planning programs um, has focused on trying to introduce um, other kinds of concerns, including environmental concerns, as constraints. 
Uh, but there are just other ways of thinking how synthesis can work. Um, and maybe most importantly, there are other ways of thinking about what you want to make in the first place. Right? So they take the, the target molecule. They don't interrogate whether this thing that we're trying to make is a worthwhile thing to be trying to make. The target is just sort of taken for granted and not interrogated as the starting point of the investigation. Yes? Um, I, the, the, the short answer is a cop-out answer, which is it can really vary significantly. Um, what's, uh, the way most of the kinds of um, programs I was referring to uh, work is that what gets fed in is the structure, one of these structural formulas of a chemical compound, and uh, what comes out the other side is either the prediction of a particular property so maybe it's the LD50, the amount of uh, the substance that will prove um, uh, terminally toxic, that will kill 50% of lab animals to which it's administered. Uh, it's nice to not have to kill that many lab animals in trying to determine a quantity like that. And maybe you don't need to actually know that very precisely in order to make a judgment about the safety of a chemical. And so um, it may well be that in certain circumstances, the predictions are accurate enough. Um, in other circumstances, uh, they'll um, be less accurate, and maybe you're dealing with you know, compounds that can potentially have some mutagenic effect at a very small concentration, say. And so there might be a concern that this modeled data is not sufficient to uh, make, say, regulatory judgments on the basis of. Uh, the historically significant and socially significant dimension of this is that there's really a lot of uncertainty surrounding um, the potential, the reliability of a lot of these judgments, which uh, makes them good for having fights with um, and not necessarily good for making definitive judgments with. Um, and uh, one of the constitutive features of politics of chemical toxicity is like lots of fights and not a lot of definitive decisions that people are satisfied with. Um, and so I think that um, thinking about not just whether or not these tools, how precise and accurate some of these modeling tools are, but in what cases is precision and accuracy, whose interests is precision or, and accuracy, or maybe even absence of precision and accuracy serving? What kinds of arguments is a more or less precise, more or less accurate um, perception of the functioning of a tool um, who are using you know, these features uh, into what end? Yes. Also, your archive or archives, how you, the source materials, how you found them, the discoveries, you know, tell us a bit more about the process. Sure, sure. Um, so I, I got interested in this project. I was originally um, a literature scholar interested in chemistry, and I just thought, oh, I, I, I like chemistry, and I like the close reading of the close structure of language. Um, and I got interested in the history of science, and I thought, well, maybe I'll do something having to do with the fine structure of language and chemistry. Um, and I actually ended up doing the project I came to grad school with, which is like an unusual thing. So I, I, I think it was dumb luck, really. But uh, the, um, the archives I've drawn upon um, are um, a pretty wide range of kinds of materials. So for the earlier part of the story I tell in my book, which is centered in Europe in the late 19th century, um, there are a lot of materials from individual scientists' papers who were closely involved in um, events like the Geneva Congress and other discussions of uh, the development of chemical nomenclature methods and standards. Um, so papers of you know, chemists at the University of Geneva or Heidelberg um, or stuff in the Archive Nationale about French chemists working in Paris. 
uh, I look at, and that includes correspondence and notes from minutes of meetings and things like that. Um, I have material from corporate archives, like the Bear Archive, that's where those photographs came from. Archives of 3M I've looked at in Minnesota. Um, we were talk I was talking with some folks today about getting at corporate sources and actually like often um, materials from corporations that you might not think would be accessible are when they've been deposited with a third party, with a historical society, a local or state level historical society. Uh, I've also gotten materials from chemical abstracts. I went there and did some oral history and somebody sent me a box of materials, said go nuts, and I was like, oh, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and um, you know, some of the more recent materials I've gotten through kind of a lot of stuff through doing oral history and having interviews. So that's where I got the film. That's just a short clip from a hour and a half long film documenting the Lhasa project that like the 16 millimeter film was shipped out to me in a big box and I got it digitized and, um, and uh, any other particularly interesting source stories. Um, yeah, so it's really eclectic and it's not necessarily an approach to a project that I would advocate to somebody who wants to like have a, a nice, well-defined research project that will be done and easily revised into a book in a straightforward fashion. But, um, but I've just always been interested in drawing together different kinds of questions and different kinds of sources um, as, uh, you know, as best I can. Oh, my favorite source, sorry, is, is one I've been working on recently and it is a, um, a parody uh, issue of the Journal of the Society for Chemical Industry that was published for a banquet dinner of the New York section of the society in 1898. Um, and as, um, as the, the historian Robert Darton notes um, in super famous article about um, why it is that a bunch of um, printers kill, apprentice, printers apprentices killed a bunch of cats um, in uh, 18th century Paris, um, jokes Right, or this amazing trove of historical material where you can, if you can figure out what the jokes are about, you've really figured something out about a certain historical community. And so this parody article has all sorts of really interesting connection or like kind of uh, gives you all kinds of material to help me understand what the visions of the future are among this group, the positive and negative visions of the future among this group of chemists in New York largely emigres from the UK and from Germany, in the late 19th century. Um, and it's saturated with material reflecting on American empire. American empire, both continental empire, the American West and uh, trans-Pacific empire, access to um, uh, the East through opening up trading ports in the Philippines, this is the middle of the Philippine colonial war. This is like, you know, there's like a version of the white man's burden, the chemist's burden that shows up in, sort of, and so it's, it's really, you know, I, I just, I, I learned a huge amount through that source. Yes. Uh, and a quick fact question, and then mm -hmm. we have a context question. The, the Lhasa, Lhasa image thing that you showed us, is that built on top of Sketchpad? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, because it it just had all the sketchbook mm -hmm. features, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, in in information circles, we like point to Sketchpad as the origin of things like stretchy bands. Yeah, and yeah, blood, yeah. So it would have been like upsetting to the history of visualization mm -hmm. if it really. But I think it, I think it's built on top of. Was was Sutherland involved with Sketchpad? Yes. So Sutherland consulted. He we had like just come back. Ivan Sutherland, um, who had done his degree at MIT, goes to work for DARPA had come back and was at Harvard at the time and like he and Corey ran into each other and Corey was pitching him this and so I was like, oh yeah, you could do this. So yeah, that's one of the connections, yeah. That's kind of cool. So here's like a general visualization tool applied mm -hmm. to chemistry. No one's done that work. That's, mm -hmm. that's cool that you're doing that. Um, so the other one, so this quote, I love this quote, really interesting. Um, I'm wondering, if, does he, I want you to tell me whether he really means, what, like, you're kind of suggesting like past and future means um, like almost like a environmental version past and future, like where are these chemicals coming from, where are they going, what are their impacts? Is that, is that what he meant here? What, what, uh, what Girard uh, mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I get the sense, like, you know, if you're talking to molecular mechanics people, they have a past and future for chemics levels, but they just mean, like, it used to be like this, and then it shaped, reshaped like that, yeah, or like yeah. protein folding people yes. talk about past and future, mm -hmm. but they don't mean, I don't know. They're thinking temporarily, yeah, there's a kind of, a, there, there's a way of thinking with a dimension of time but it's it's not historical time, or it's you know it's it's like kind of reversible um, physics time. Uh, Girard's specific 
reference here is that he thinks that the formula you draw for a molecule should tell you the specific reaction you use to make it. Um, so he's, he's, you know, he's not thinking in the way that I'm employing this exactly. But importantly, he is thinking that there is some trace of how you made the stuff that should stay with it. Um, that you should represent a chemical substance um, in a way that tells you the particular reaction that you used to form it, that doesn't just you know, purport to represent. So you can have like what is empirically can be the, the substance, two substances with equivalent properties if you do any kind of chemical manipulations of the two, but that are, have different representations based on the reactions that you use to make them. And I think that concept is really significant for pushing past um, arguments about um, the, uh, that a, it doesn't matter how a substance was made. That, oh, like there's a certain chemical substance that is made by some you know, species of uh, you know, like ocean dwelling species in extreme circumstances. And it's so like, you know, it's natural. It's, and so like kind of pushing back against arguments that it doesn't matter if a, if a material is produced synthetically or industrially. Because there are all sorts of features of substances, you know, the concentrations, all sorts of measurable dimensions of them that do differ depending on how something is produced. And it would be nice to be able to uh, reckon with that in the way that you're thinking about ontologically about what the thing is. If I can interrupt for one second, just to pause and let people, let folks go who needed to get mm -hmm. the five o'clock since that's technically one of the session. Mm -hmm. And if you have a few minutes, I'm gracious enough to stick around for other people who have questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks for coming. All right, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so it's a great talk, super, super awesome. Um, this is just a uh, question going back to your first set of stories and your showcasing of some of the earlier indexes. And mm -hmm. So I'm just curious whether um, sort of like innovation, whether you thought, had a time to think at all about the innovations, the bibliographic innovations going on in Europe at the end yeah. of the 19th century mm -hmm. and like how they're, whether they're connected to these folks that you're talking about. Like are they, hang, I, I don't know, I'm just curious whether they're hanging out with like Paul Atle and like, in his big library? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, so there's um, surprisingly little, to me anyway, surprisingly little direct connection among the, the chemists who are designing rules of nomenclature and the editors who are using rules of nomenclature to okay. put 10,000 chemical substances in alphabetical order. But I think that but between those groups and the Paul Oetlais and Henri Lafontaine's, who have these like information utopia visions. Um, there's actually kind of a, they're, they're two separate communities. So like the physical chemist Wilhelm Ostwald um, and big time polymath, visionary, universalist thinker. Um, he is sort of in conversation with Oetlais and Lafontaine, but Ostwald is the very chemist who had that like dismissive quotation from 1887 that I had on the early slide that all this organic chemistry business is um, just mechanical, scientifically uninteresting, um, you know, prospecting. Yeah, so, well, so, so it's the organic chemists and editors who are, who are doing this uninteresting work of compilation and what a universal system should be about is like constituting a synoptic view of everything everywhere, which also relies on information, but it's a different vision yeah. of how information can be organized and mobilized yeah. that is um, much less pragmatic yeah, yeah. than the, you know, these chemists who are really trying to support research and development yeah. in emerging, you know, increasingly large chemical firms yeah. um, with their own um, research laboratories and libraries. And you often see that, like, it, 
Bayer or DuPont or BASF, the, li the research library and the research laboratory get opened more or less contemporaneously. Uh -huh. There's a strong connection there. So, um, so I think there are two different communities of compilation or communities of information un universalisms of different sorts. Um, uh, in, in Europe at this period. There are connections at the level of, of the print, the publishers and printers. I think just if you look at typesetting, if you look at the methods of how proofs are being handled, there's a lot of, I, I think there's a lot of learning that's going on at, at um, Leopold Foss or you know a little bit later at Springer or some of these other firms. And there is, um, and I think that there's something, I haven't figured out the answer yet, but I think that um, the, the bibliographic nature of these compilations. Like if you look at an early 19th century chemical handbook, yeah. um, there's not the same emphasis on citations. It's like we're going to gather up the data, we're going to make a, we're going to critique and try to gather up the best data about chemical substances, but we're not going to worry about necessarily giving references to all of the individual sources of this data. And I have to think that the increasing emphasis on citations is related to the develop, developments across a wide range of scholarly fields um, history, philology, especially in Germany in this 19th century period where like constituting an archive in, involving um, in using methods of source criticism involving careful bibliography yeah. is, is developing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, thanks for your talk. It was great. Um, so what I was thinking about when I was listening to your talk was um, this piece that I read recently by Linda Nash that sort of tracing like the Cold War origins of environmental policy, but tracing this history um, where regulation sort of was framed around purity and then it sort of changed to being framed around safety and then it sort of changed again to being framed around risk. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking about was with that in mind, um, that slide that you showed, I think it was um, related to Nixon era mm -hmm. regulation, um, where the human, the man is in relation to his environment. Um, and I was thinking about like how um, these chemical, these, you know, these models essentially, the graph theory of these chemical structures, like I was thinking about the way that, that a person has to fit the chemical models as well. So like mm -hmm. that risk thing, um, that risk transition in policy meant that the models also had to be occupied by statistical people yeah. rather than yeah. identified people. And I'm curious like what you think about that or what you noticed in your own research about like how as the chemicals became these concrete these particular ontological um, formations, how the people that would make sense in relation to those chemicals developed as well? Did you notice mm -hmm. anything like that or thoughts? Uh, yeah, so like these references to bodies of chemical and biological information yeah. is um, something I've been thinking a lot about and thinking about the, the body that it issue here is a body of information and human bodies are getting dealt with in some other way as statistical patterns within a body of information. Um, that's just a kind of, maybe that's just word games, but there seems to me to be something there and I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, I'm interested in tracing the history of the term endpoint and the idea that, that what we're concerned about is demarcating specific endpoints, which an endpoint is not a phenomenological thing. An endpoint is a purely statistical I mean, I guess like death is a phenomenological thing, but like, you know, most of the endpoints are things other than, than death um, that get disaggregated and become subject to statistics. And those are the things that you can have, you know, like record, like um, fields in your record, in your body of chemical and biological information about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, so those are the two ways I was thinking about that, but it's a, yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking over the past and future. Mm -hmm. When you were describing that, it was, it was in terms of how you are, it was thinking of chemistry, so not the act of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, how does that differ from now if uh, the source of which chemistry is still learned is in the lab? Mm -hmm. and there's kind of information that you try to do modeling, but mm -hmm. it's not verified. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I think like going back to the opening quotation I gave from that article in, in Nature, um, uh, 
I think that that for some practitioners in in chem informatics, um, what they're they're just like interested in developing models and making predictions and um, lab work is the bottleneck. You know, and what's interesting is exploring chemical space and figuring out ways of suggesting new lead compounds in drug discovery or in materials development. Uh, and um, it's it's a bother that the chemists doing the bench work aren't, you know, working more quickly to let them continue their um, in virtual investigations. Um, I I think like. A really important feature of doing organic chemistry specifically is there's a lot of waiting. Um, to a certain extent, this seems to be decreasing as more and more robotics is introduced into chemistry labs. But there's just a lot of waiting, sitting in labs. Your reaction takes eight hours to go. And it's just the nature of the process that you've got to wait eight hours. And if you get the brown gunk, instead of the white powder, like I always did when I was in the lab, and you've got to wait another eight hours. Uh, and, and I think that that's an important dimension, both for interpreting this quotation by Girard and thinking about the dimension of time. And you know, thinking with, for example, with uh, one of Henri Bergson's uh, go-to examples for why he thought that time had to be understood phenomenologically rather than in this abstract, incremental, you know, quantitative fashion, uh, was that um, if you want to dissolve sugar in water, you've got to wait for the sugar to dissolve. And there's no getting around the experience of waiting for your sugar to dissolve into your tea or water or whatever. Uh, and I think that that's important. Um, one example of a broader collection of um, experiences of doing chemistry that's, among other things, important for the formation of, for identity formation among chemists and for thinking about what, how chemists construe their own expertise and who has, and what kinds of claims they are entitled to make that other people might not be entitled to make about the um, qualities, possibilities, safety, hazard, usefulness of material substances. Um, I haven't thought carefully about that, but but I think it's I think it's important to reckon with. Yeah. Oh. Did you want to quickly follow up on that? Or? Yeah. But I'll yeah. Uh huh. Um, the, I guess the idea of like, how some of these things are conceptualized, how them, how they are made into a whole registry system. Was it only a few pedigrees that were learning these things, or was it a true convention, like a lot of different types of people instead of like five, ten people that were the conversation? Mm -hmm. um, made it there were. Um, a, a wide range of chemists. The idea of um, translating chemical structural formulas into words and then back became not necessarily follow, not necessarily following one specific set of rules strictly and algorithmically, but just this capacity to work with real complicated names and recover a structure from them became a really a quite important part of training in chemistry. Uh, chemists, uh, when they got together in things like this, eighteen ninety eight banquet dinner would after dinner like retire and and you know like have drinking songs involving reciting long litanies of uh, these names to like the tune of Der Wacht am Rhein and other you know and like Auld Lang Syne and other patriotic tunes of their national origin um, uh, and so working with th this kind of thinking and reasoning and and facility became pretty widely distributed within um, uh, among chemists, chemists working in all sorts of different settings, um, you know, in industry independently for themselves, in government, in addition to in academic settings, a pretty large group, like kind of the largest group of trained scientists in most European and uh, North American contexts and the, you know, really even through the present day, but certainly um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so, uh, but the specific set of capacities that would enable you to like work reliably and create unique names for every compound that could conceivably be listed in chemical abstracts that was a very very narrow form of expertise that was really um, concentrated among the people especially working on indexing indexes 
um, and then forms of this expertise um, uh, got taken up or become the basis of um, uh, constituting other sorts of fields like doing patent searching for uh, chemicals and um, in a few other areas, yeah. yeah. Devin. Uh, so there's a slide, uh, I have two questions about mm -hmm. Lhasa. One, one is this, this slide uh, that has a flowchart uh, and a couple of other things. There's a snippet of code on here. Mm -hmm. Is this designed to be, like it looks like it's supposed to be a readable yep. code system. Is that Lhasa or is it a different product? That is Lhasa, it's the language, so it's this language which they called Chemtran, okay. CHMTRN, Chemtran. So, so, so this is developed as a, what you would do is you would map out in a flowchart the set of decisions that would be made to judge, um, to assign a possible backward step a value. Is this a good, plausible backward step we can take? Is this like totally chemically impossible and we should throw it out? Um, so really elaborate. Um, set of criteria to formally go through the process of evaluating all of the possible factors and making such a decision. So this flow chart would be made and that would be real hard and the grad students would get together and they'd work on it for a week and they'd go to Corey and Corey would sort of gesture his hand here and make a few pronouncements and they would go back to work for a week. But then this language was developed as a way of taking the finished flowchart and translating it into a form that would very importantly be readable to chemists and manipulable later on by chemists um, and that there was another um, uh, language that was used to rework this into something that could be like compiled as Fortran. Okay, got it. Mm. Uh, and so then who, who did they make this video for? They made the video for, Corey didn't remember when I asked him. I think he had sort of forgotten like why it was made and uh, I think it was, it, I think it was at least partly made for, for the funders, but I think it was like they, I, I think in part the people in the project thought this is pretty cool. I think, and let's, you know, let's, you know, we, I think just like they had, we've got this computer, what can we do with it? Like we've got this movie camera, what can we do with it? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the 19th century mm -hmm. uh, history, and in particular, um, I'm wondering about um, your presentation that the structural formulas in general weren't treated as uh, deeply representational, right, of the underlying reality. And it seems to me that that maybe their status was a little more uh, contested, that it wasn't clear in the community. And so, I mean, one of the reasons why, and well, across the communities, obviously there are lots of different sorts of communities using them. Um, because, because I've always been tempted to think about the development of the structural, uh, the structural formulas in relation to debates about atomism in mm -hmm. the 19th century. And, um, and, and specifically, I guess, have been interested in the work of Benjamin Brody, which mm -hmm. I think sort of only makes sense to the extent, I mean, Brody clearly was worried that the structural formulas were pushing, precisely because of their pragmatic utility, were pushing the community implicitly to accept an atomistic vision, even while there wasn't good empirical evidence for it at that point in time, and was worried about mm -hmm. that, right, the impact of that. And mm -hmm. so then when he introduced this other algebraic formulation that was intended to get rid of all the structural formulas precisely because of that kind of worry um, as an alternative and as a more uh, neutral representation of what the underlying reality was. I mean, ultimately didn't work because pragmatically it wasn't feasible, but it seems to me that sort of, uh, that brings to the surface that there was a real tension in the community, that some people were, um, quite tempted to read the formulas in a realistic way, and others were very tempted to read it much more instrumentally, mm -hmm. um, depending on how committed they were to mm -hmm. atomism and, and kind of a molecular vision mm -hmm. already at that stage. Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what you, what you think about that, if you think that's, that that, that, that sense of uh, a debate in the community that on some level is recognized by uncertainty of the status of mm -hmm. the representations, whether that seems accurate or not. Yeah. 
I mean, you, you were going through quite quickly. Yeah. So it's a little hard for me yeah. to, to know. Um, so I'm just. Yeah, it's a fair assessment of my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a really absolutely um, centrally important question to the history of chemistry in the 19th century that I just kind of glossed over in my talk. But um, the uh, so this question is, um, what are chemical substances? Are there individual units, the kinds of things that get referred to and have a long you know, tradition going back to classical antiquity of being referred to as atoms that are indivisible, discrete units that are connecting up in some way? Or um, do we not have any good evidence that that's the way that the world is structured at the micro level? And should we not take that hypothesis on board? Because it might, it's unjustified. It might be limiting. We might fail to discover certain things or be misled by thinking in this way. Um, the work of, of Alan Rock, um, historian of 19th century chemistry, um, is basically my go-to source on thinking about these questions. And, and so what, what Alan argues is that um, there are two kinds of atomism that have to be distinguished. Physical atomism, which is this realist commitment to the notion that there are real physical atoms that are like little balls, you know, connected to each other. And like John Dalton, the um, uh, British physicist, early or chemist in the early 20th century is a good example, or early 19th century, a good example of this. Um, but then there's this other softer form of way of thinking, uh, more pragmatic approach to atoms, which is chemical atomism. Rock refers to, and you know, in that language is used physical atoms and chemical atoms by in various different ways by a lot of actors in the period. Uh, which is that you know we're not going to claim that and make any claims about how the world is structured at this nanoscale level. Uh, but gosh, it's useful to just kind of pragmatically behave as if there are these individual indiv indivisible units that persist and reconnect with each other uh, through chemical reactions. And what Rock argues is that most everybody is making strong um, uh, agnostic arguments toward physical atomism, um, no matter what. How, whatever their approach to use of structural formulas or not in chemistry is, like we're not claiming that this is how the world works, uh, but that almost all chemists, even those who are making really strong um, arguments against atomism, are in fact de facto chemical atomists because they're even with their own, even like somebody like Brody. Brody might be a limit case, but certainly some of the stronger critics, like Marcel Berthelot, a French chemist, um, were working with something like atom like. Um, uh, formulas and, and concepts in their work. So I think the, the more apt distinction to me to make is almost, you know, what I take from Rock's work is that thinking in terms of pragmatists and thinking in terms of principalists or people who made, like, who were really cared about epistemological questions um, is uh, kind of the more significant breaking point, and there were just a lot of chemists who didn't. And that breaks down along, um, along institutional lines, just in terms of the difference between the organization of the German and British and French education systems and like the politics of, like if you're in Paris, you're going to be having arguments about epistemology, because that's what like people in Paris in the 19th century, even through the present day, do. Um, and But less so at the more um, independent German universities stronger ties um, toward the late 19th century with emerging industries. Yeah. Can I ask a direct follow on mm -hmm. So I actually I want to restate and see if I get your argument um, in the larger picture. So and this is really helpful. So it's you're saying that at that point in time in the 19th century there was like a there was two possible models, but they were being fairly careful, the physical and chemical you were saying. Or, and, and so is am I to understand that like the molecular ideal and especially with that quote that you said about like mm -hmm. structures for yeah. Or ontologies for God and infrastructure. So the molecular ideal is a kind of a slippage that has occurred or a sloppiness that has occurred in the direction of what we used to be very careful thinking about those two chemicals. And we've sort of like gotten into this like, well, whatever, representation, reality. Or, I, don't, I, I think it's more, um, so my argument is that the molecular ideal is what happens when a mode of representation that is from the beginning conventional um, and that is taken as a convenient way of using this 
form of representation, you know, that is tied to the observation of empirical behavior of chemical substances, uh, but might be used flexibly in lots of different ways and saying, we're going to consider these structural formulas to be drawn in one particular kind of way so that we can make names based on them so that we can organize our bibliographies. So this conventional tool, um, not arbitrary, but conventional mode of identification and representation for use in bibliography for dealing with large collections of chemicals, not for dealing with thinking about individual chemicals, um, gets picked up um, and reused outside of the chemical sciences um, in adjacent fields uh, and sometimes even within the chemical sciences in, or within um, informatics work within chemistry, say. So um, an ontology, the, a way of doing bibliography when one wishes to do things other than find a citation in, within collections of very large collections of many, many you know, different identities of chemical substances, that's when the um, convention takes on ontological force. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say about that. And that was, I forgot. Anyway. Well, thank you. Yeah. We do need to get Evan to dinner. So oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you.